Father, you are a good God, and we thank you so much that we can be completely given over to you. We know that we will never be let down. We will never be hurt by Almighty God. We can trust you completely because your mercy endures forever. Father, thank you for being with us so far this evening and helping us in our praise. Help us also now in the Word of God. We need your help, Father. We need your hand to touch us, and we need your voice to be heard within our hearts. So, Lord, I pray for every single person in here tonight that each one of us would be opened up by the Holy Spirit and that we would hear God speaking to us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for the message tonight is Making Camp in the Promised Land. Making Camp in the Promised Land. Over the last few weeks, we've been considering several key moments in Israel's history. We've been considering the parting of the Jordan. We were thinking about the stepping into the Jordan. Tonight, we're not thinking about crossing over the Jordan. That was last week. Tonight, we're thinking about making camp at Gilgal. We're not going to be thinking about Gilgal. That will be another time in chapter 5. But tonight we're going to be focused on verse 19 of chapter 4. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. This is yet another moment in Israel's history. And it connects with our own lives and it connects with the church. After 40 long years, Israel had finally entered into the promised land. And they've set up camp. They are now making camp in the promised land. In this passage, Israel are now standing on the land that God had sworn to give their fathers. Their forefathers had received this from God, and now they are on the land, and God's abundance and promise just stretches out before them. An incredible promise. And for us, this moment represents a new chapter. A new chapter that God is calling us into. A time of blessing, a time of renewal, a time of purpose. When we think of Israel in the promised land, it's, it's, we see ourselves actually standing where God said we're going to be. So they've entered, made camp. The day and month on which this all took place is really significant. And it demonstrates a beautiful sovereignty. The beautiful sovereignty of God is demonstrated here. The way he plans it all and the way he goes about making it happen. The day was the tenth day. That's what we're told. It was the first month. The month was Abib or Nisan. The journey to the promised land ordinarily should take 11 days. That's what we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 1, the first few verses. 
It's a journey of 11 days. Israel had left Egypt 40 years earlier. And now the day on which they enter the land is to the very day 40 years later. Is that not amazing? It's 40 years to the day that Israel had made their final preparations for the Passover to get out of Egypt. To the day. Do you hear God? God sent to the people almost, can you believe this? Can you grasp this? 40 years ago today, you were making preparation for the Passover because you were leaving Egypt. Now, 40 days later, exactly, you're going into the promised land. Do you see the significance in that? Does that is that just going, whoosh, or is it hitting your heart? Because you see, this is important. God's timing. God's sovereignty, God's control. God's plan will not be thwarted. Israel were to be in the promised land and because of their rebellion, they didn't get there in 11 days. It took them 40 years wandering in the desert or being led through the desert by God. 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years? <sighs> Kenny was 10. I was 23. 40 years making their way on an 11 day journey. But the day in which they were to leave Egypt is the day in which they enter the promised land. What a God we serve. When did God give you the promise that's in your heart tonight? When did God give you that promise? It might not have been 40 years ago, but it might have been a while. Nothing can thwart his plan. And so no matter how long it takes you, it might be through your own rebellion, it might be through circumstance, but whatever God has promised you, brother or sister it's coming and it might just be a lovely little twist that the timing and the moment is precious like it must have been for Israel when you look back you think my goodness me how amazing it is that it's now that I'm entering in You see, in Exodus 12, in verses 2 and 3, we're, we're told that this is the month that they were to move. And we'll read them. God is just so good. Well, verse 1 of, of Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month, Abib, or Nisan, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their father, their fathers, a lamb for a house, and the preparations for their exit was underway. Now their entry has been accomplished. These intervening years, four decades of intervening years, do you know something? 
the abundant blessings that God had promised them 40 years earlier or before, those abundant blessings were awaiting them for 40 years in the promised land. You're going into the promised land. The blessings are going to be abundant. Forty years. They go for a donor in the desert. But all that time, the blessings are awaiting. The blessings are there. Do you see what I'm saying? How long? How long has Zion been waiting? Zion has known great blessing. But all that time in between the, 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 the call home of Pastor Glass to just now, all that time, the blessings have been waiting. Is that no brilliant? As if you believe it. The blessings have been waiting. All the time God has been leading the church through these years, the blessings have still been there. That really thrills me because you see, we're heading. All these years, He'd planned it for them and abundance lay in front of them. This month, Abib, or Nisan, that's the first month in the Hebrew year. And that's a month when the corn is full and ready. That's a month when there is abundance just lying in front of them. This is the newness. This is new beginning on this month. The grain is full and abundance beckons. Fresh hope. Fresh wonder. making preparation for the Passover. It speaks of newness. It speaks of, it speaks of renewal. The Passover. And after the Passover, newness. A new experience. Freedom. Liberty. Out of Egypt. Magnificent. In the month of Abib. Oh Israel we're going to cross over. Israel have crossed over. They're now making camp in Gilgal. There's going to be battles. Oh there's going to be struggle. But there's going to be freshness. There's going to be hope. There's going to be abundance. And all lies out there. Hallelujah. But there's something else. The month of Bib is really intriguing when it comes to Zion Baptist Church. Because, and this gave me goosebumps as I was reading this and thinking about it. The month of Abib corresponds most closely with the month of April. When did the blessings begin that we are currently enjoying? The month of April. Wow, I'm getting the goosebumps already. I don't want to put too much store in that, but, but boy, am I excited. 
I don't want to be dogmatic about it, but oh, Abib, April, we've been, we've been experiencing new things since April. Abundance lies before us. People, be excited. Please be excited about this. See, when you see these things in Scripture, it's really thrilling. God's telling us. God, I believe God is telling us you are already in the process of crossing over. We have been praising his holy name all this time since April in an abundant way and in a new way. We've seen people touched. We've seen people excited. We've seen captives released already. Captives have been set free. We've seen it. It's, it's happening. Since Abib. Oh, it's only beginning, but it's happening. We need to take this seriously when we see these things in Scripture. Because it's not coincidence. Why didn't we start praising God this way in February? Why didn't we wait to June? I'll tell you why. Because the people of Israel crossed over in a bib. They crossed over in April. Oh, let's keep going, eh? So they're in the land. This divinely planned blessings had been lying in wait for them for 40 years. And now they're in the land. Our eternal blessings, they're waiting for us. There's an inheritance being kept in heaven for you and me. And nothing can thwart God's plan of giving us those blessings. Nothing. But he's got plans here. We're told in Jeremiah 29 and 11, and some people know, Peggy knows at least, how important that verse is. It's important to every Christian, I know that but how important that has been to me for years and years and years. But we're told in that verse, God isn't making plans for us. We're told in that verse, the plans are already made. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I'm not trying to think them up. I've not been waiting until now to see how things have panned out and then try and plan the next step for you. It's already planned. Do you hear that, Zion? The next step for us is already planned. And in that verse, we're told that it's a good plan, aren't we? We're told that it's a plan to prosper us spiritually, to give us hope and a future. Where? In the promised land. In the land that God has prepared for us. In the here and now. What a saviour is our saviour. He's made the plans. And then in Jeremiah chapter 33 in verse 3 we're told there that God will show us 
mighty things. Things we haven't seen before. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's a wonderful verse. He'll show us great and mighty things that we knowest not, but he knowest completely. Great things. Mighty things. The word for mighty could be translated hidden. That's awesome too. God has great things for you personally and for us corporately. We can't see them just now because he's hidden them. But he's going to show us. He's going to reveal these great things to us at just the right moment. Already prepared. But out of sight. But they're not going to be out of sight forever. Because we're being led into the promised land. And when we find our footprint on the soil of the promised land, we can be assured that God is going to show us these things. We are Christ's workmanship, or we are God's workmanship in Christ, created in Christ, hoped for. For the good works that God has already prepared for us, already prepared and as we make our way forward he will bring those plans to us one by one piece by piece step by step but he isn't waiting to see how to go about it he's gone about it here's the thing his plan is for you and for me and for us to be in the promised land in glory. And that was his plan from before the foundation of the world. And what he did to accomplish that plan is that he gave us Jesus Christ. Christ came to accomplish that plan and now we know that we will be in the promised land. We now know what God knew from eternity past. He's revealed that to us. But it was always there, it just was hidden. The same principle stands for your life and mine on earth. He's already planned it. And when he brings it to us, step by step, we'll walk in it. But we need to remember, it's not at that moment that God has prepared it. It's prepared already, waiting for the moment that he will say, now take this step. Now go in that direction. Zion, what confidence we should have tonight as we make our way in, as we come up out of the Jordan in the month of Abib. You know, we've been thinking about, oh, when are we going to get into the Jordan? When are we going to make our our way through? Folks, we've been doing that since April. We baby steps, it may be, but we've been doing it. We're on the way. (laughs) Praise the Lord. We're on the way. So here they come. Out of the Jordan, onto the land. And they camp at Gilgal. But why the delay? Why did it take them 40 years when all of this was lying, in a sense? All of this was was there already. Why did it take them 40 years? It 
disobedience and rebellion. A lack of trust in God. A lack of trust in God kept Israel out of the promised land for 40 years. That is a real warning, isn't it? As we go forward, that is a real advanced warning for us. that we need to trust God. We need to trust that he's taking us to this place. We need to trust the promise that God has given us personally in our lives. We need to trust that God, who has said to us, perhaps, I'll save your son, Anne. I'll save your son. Hallelujah. I'll bring them in. If God has said to you, I want you to be doing this. Maybe God has said to you, I want you to be doing something, but he hasn't quite told you right now what it is. You just know it's something. For all these promises I've just mentioned and all, every other, we need to believe God. We need to trust him. Because when we trust him, we'll be in. If we keep rebelling, and it's so easy, but when we keep rebelling, we're holding it all back. Now, I'm not saying that if you've not had your promise answered that you've been a rebel. All I'm saying is that we need to just keep believing God. And if we keep believing God, the day is coming when we will see the fulfillment of the promise that he has given us. If we give up on God, we'll never see it. But my promises, they rest and they, or they, they sit in the hands of Almighty God right now. And when I put my hand up to my father and I put my hand in his hand, can you feel the promises? Can you feel the promises? And if we keep putting our hand in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, those promises will just be tipped into our lives. Church, that's going to happen for us. As we remain faithful, as we believe God when he says we're going over, As we believe God when he says, Abib, April. We're not really waiting, we've started. We're waiting for the fullness. We're waiting to get over, but we've started the journey. <laughs> What will that day be like in glory when, we, when we're received into heaven and, and God unlocks the inheritance of all the abundance that he has for us? All the joy and wonder of heaven. Heaven is better than this. And we walk into it and we're overwhelmed by it. But you see, the fact of the matter is God has the key in his hand to unlock the promises for us today. Our God can open the storehouses of heaven. 
and pour out such an abundant blessing that what? We can't contain it. That's what Malachi teaches us. And here's the thing God says there in chapter 3 in verse 10. Try me. Try me in this. I mean, can you hear that? Can you hear Almighty God saying to you and me? Try me out. I've told you I'm going to bless you abundantly. I've told you that that you're making your way into into an abundant future, a beautiful future. Battles, yes, but victory, secure. You're going into this promised land on this side of glory. Hallelujah. This is what God says. And then he says to us through Malachi, do you believe me? Try me and see if I won't open up the heavens and pour it all out. That's what faith does. That's what trust does. That's what trust in the almighty God does. When he says to us, we believe him. When he tries us with something difficult, we believe him. When he, when he lays a, a big request before us, because you see, that's what God does. And every time we make an advance, he comes in and he gives us a bigger request, a bigger test. Lay that before me, God says. This that I've given you, this massive thing, you lay that before me and see if I don't just fill it with my abundance. I know that there are people in the church tonight who are looking for the way forward for them personally. Well, you better hear that word. Church, we need to hear it. Because we have an exciting future. We will be battle scarred. And I keep emphasizing this because I don't want anyone to think I'm preaching prosperity gospel here. We will be battle scarred as we take possession of what God has given us. But if we trust him, we will take possession. Hallelujah. And we will be where and what he wants us to be. This is what kept Israel out. This was why there was such a delay. And so we look at our lives and without being so introspective that it paralyzes us. We deal with what needs to be dealt with and move on. And we continue to trust him for what's coming. And so they make their camp at Gilgal. Or the place that would later be called Gilgal. We'll see that in the next chapter as well. But for now, Gilgal is the first place that they camped in. This is the first of their camps. This is where the 12 stones will be erected as a a memorial. And we're told in verses 20 through to the end of that chapter of what that means and and we looked at that last week so we won't go into all of that again tonight but we're told that the purpose of the stones is a memorial for the generations to come but we do need to remember these stones tell us God did great things in the past. But they're also there to strengthen us for the future. That our same God will do great things in the future. Zion, our best days are not behind us. They're in front of us. And that's not to disparage 
what's happened in the past. Can I never met the pastor? But I love Peggy. And the family. So I'm not disparaging what, what happened. All I'm saying is, wonderful though it was, the future is glorious if we keep trusting God. But what Gilgal serves as, as they go into the promised land, it becomes a beachhead. You know what a beachhead is? It's the, it's the place where, where they establish themselves for future missions, future advance into the land. And as we go through Joshua, we'll see that they keep coming back to Gilgal. They come back to Gilgal at times. That's the beachhead where, where they set off from. That's the place that they've established for the further advance crossing the Jordan into the promised land. Joshua chapter 9 and verse 6. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal. You see, it's still there. This isn't Joshua chapter 9. They went to the camp at Gilgal and said unto him, unto the men of Israel, We be come for a far, from a far country, and now therefore make ye a league with us. Here are these folks coming in, the Gibeonites, tricky people, but they're coming in, where to? Gilgal. Because Israel are there. The camp is there, established. And then in chapter 10 and in verse 6. The men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal. He's still there. Israel are still there. That's their headquarters. That's the place of their base for everything else that they're going to do. Chapter 14 and verse 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. Still the beachhead from where every other mission goes out. That's what is being established here. This is the place, the first place where they establish themselves on Canaan's soil. Marks the beginning of a brand new season for Israel. We'll establish ourselves at Gilgal and from Gilgal we will move out and take the land. Can you see the picture? We know that we're going home to glory and our beachhead is the cross. Guaranteeing us that we're getting there. Guaranteeing us that we are going to, from the cross, we take possession of the promised land and glory. It's because of the establishing of our faith in the, the cross of Jesus Christ that we can be sure that we're going home to glory and everything that God has for us there will be ours. It's at Gilgal that the, that the Israelites re-established their covenant with God. Chapter 5, verse 3, verse 2. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel. The second time Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins, which is Gilgal. A recommitment 
to Almighty God. It's there in verse 10 of chapter 5 that they re-establish the Passover. They've crossed the Jordan into the new land and they're going to start with a Passover which celebrates their, their newness and the, and the future life that they have with God. Do you see what it means for us? Here. We need to establish a beachhead on the promised land. Oh, no, we don't. It's already been established. We go over as the sons of God through Jesus Christ, who has set the beachhead in place already, and it's the cross. As much as the cross is taking us to glory, it's through the cross we will be established in this promised land. It's through our faith in Christ and Him crucified that will take us on and into the future. In the promised land that we are longing for, we will encamp around Calvary. And from there, every other mission will come or will go. And we'll keep coming back to our Joshua, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. Lord, what's next? Lord, what's next? We will advance and we will take the land. But we'll do so through the cross. It's not going to happen through your strength or mine or anybody else's. Only through Calvary. So important that we establish a sure footing. That's celebration, by the way. A sure footing. What we're going to do, Andrew's already told us in song, we're going to plant our feet in the soil of Canaan, our promised land. We're going to plant our feet, plunge our feet into the soil. We are going to be planted by God as trees of righteousness for his glory. This is guaranteed as we trust him and move forward with him. As we believe every word he says, he will be glorified. We're going to advance deeper into the promises. We're going to advance deeper and deeper into Isaiah 61. You better study Isaiah 61. Because that is for us. And we're going to go bit by bit and experience it. Piece by piece. Blessing by blessing. Do you think your pastors are raving lunatic? I hope you don't. Because you see, we're going forward. And there's something wonderful about going forward with God. You and your life, whatever promise you're mulling over right now, the same is true. You will advance deeper into that promise through the cross of Jesus Christ and by staying close to him. And it will open up bit by bit and don't worry when you come to a door that's closed and you can't get through that door that's okay God guides us by closed doors as well and we just change our focus and there's the door and we go through bit by bit when you've established your beachhead as the cross of Jesus Christ, then the promised land for you will be taken. Zion, it will be taken. 
because we thank God that in this church it has always been preached Jesus Christ and him crucified every blessing in your life every promise you're holding on to as we've been seeing recently has the scarlet thread of his blood all the way through it Zion it's true it's true the scarlet thread of his blood is all the way through his promise for us to go into a future that we've never seen never known Are you going to keep praising God? Because we're going over behind Judah and we're going to the camp behind Judah. Are we going to praise God tonight? Are we going to take the next step in praise? When will we know that we're there? You know, folks, if we keep our eyes on Isaiah 61 and we see it happen bit by bit, I firmly believe that we're going to suddenly find we're in the promised land. We're going to suddenly turn around and see the river is back in its place and we're over. Are you with me? Are we going together? Hallelujah. What a saviour. Let's pray tonight.